tomorrow, of course, make sure we go to print and spoil for everything. So please join me in all that. And are you mic'd up? We might want to mic you up. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming here on what I understand Friday because Wednesday is a really issue. <laughs> um, you're coming to hear my talk, and I would like to say that I'm very, very grateful to Hannah for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure to be here and have so many wonderful conversations with many of you. Um, Okay, so let me get to my talk on fourth microbial footprint and um, soil carbon again. Um, what uh, stimulates, uh, stimulated my work in this direction is this um, general problem that I started to see exist in um, a lot of what um, our soil physics uh, research does. Um, or not just soil physics, but um, basically a disconnect between what soil physicists, soil microbiologists, and soil biochemists do. And um, so what I try to do there is um, articulate uh, this problem, which I see as um, process-based physics being missing from efforts to understand uh, the functioning of uh, plant soil micro uh, continuum. Um, everyone knows and agrees that soil uh, chemical processes and microbial um, functioning takes place in the physical plane of the soil structure. Uh, but when it comes to actually doing our analysis in um, soil chemistry and carbon and uh, microbiology, we tend to forget or ignore that fact. And that is, um, that is unfortunate, especially uh, given uh, the, this uncertain future temperatures, um, water regimes that um, and climate brings, um, because the empirical approaches that we have developed based on past experiences might not necessarily work um, uh, for the future conditions, and that's why process-based understanding uh, becomes more and more important. Um, so specifically, what I would like to talk about today is um, one case or maybe group of cases uh, where uh, such missing of uh, soil physics um, impeded <coughs> understanding of some of the soil carbon protection um, of uh, soil carbon gain um, activities. So um, soil carbon gain and how to make soil to increase carbon levels. There have been um, literally thousands of um, research articles published on the topic, and we know a lot about what needs to be done to make soil uh, increase its carbon level. So here are some of the more, um, some of those well-known practices for success. It's important to reduce soil disturbance, and no spill would be one big example. Um, Perennial plants, um, again, lack of soil disturbance in perennial plants is another um, <coughs> recipe that will increase soil carbon. Uh, high plant diversity, always known to be a tool to increase uh, soil carbon. Having continuous life vegetation, cover crops, yes, they do increase soil carbon. And we also are more or less in good shape um, as far as understanding what are the key mechanisms um, that act behind those processes, the mechanisms that make these processes work. So we know that in order to um, have soil gain carbon, we must uh, provide carbon input. 
So we need high quantity those inputs, and those inputs should be of high quality. That is, it's not just carbon, it's uh, nitrogen, it's CN uh, ratio of those uh, carbon inputs that matter. Soil um, has, um, has to have good acting microbial communities that would then process these new carbon inputs and um, you know, turn them into those decomposition products. And then those decomposition products, what will happen with them? They will be then physically or physically, chemically or both protected with a cold editing. And that microbial protected carbon <coughs> is what now leads is the best form of carbon storage of soil that is that's where it's stored um, most efficiently for a longer period of time and most um, will be more stable there. Um, so <coughs> all is clear, right? So what I would like them to do now is to tell you about two um, examples from my research experience where those um, recipes seem to be not really working how they are supposed to work. And one the example is the um, um, organic management with sour crops, and uh, the other is uh, bioenergy cropping system with witchcraft. My first example, and uh, this comes from long-term ecological research site at Kelly Biological Station at, um, in Michigan. Um, I would so I would like to tell you about three systems that um, um, from that experiment, and they all are in corn soybean wheat rotation. And the way how I have them listed: organic, conventional, plowed, conventionally plowed, and chemically based, and no-till um, with conventional chemicals. They are listed in the order of soil disturbance, from highest to lowest. Um, we have this organic management corn soybean wheat that um, receives no any chemical. It receives no manure. Um, all it has is uh, cover crops. It's just a cereal rice after corn and wheat uh, and red clover is receded into wheat before corn. Um, it chiseled out in spring um, for corn and soybean planting. And because it doesn't receive any herbicides in their weeds, um, it does receive a very substantial amount of soil disturbance in uh, early summer. Um, some years, it could be that every single week there would be this rotary hoeing, uh, basically disturbing and mixing and distracting uh, the soil in those regions. Okay, then um, next in line comes. Um, conventional management with chemicals, so all it gets is uh, plowing and the spring preparation, so chisel plowing, and then no till that um, gets no plow and receives all the um, <coughs> chemical herbicides and um, fertilizers. Um, so all that has been going on since 1989. Mm -hmm. In 1988, the experiment started, and um, there that how long the treatments were in place since then. Um, what you see here is um, how our soil carbon changed in uh, from 88 when the baseline soil um, samples were taken to 2006. Um, so here is again the, the same order: organic, conventional, and no-till. And you can see that those changes in carbon, they are not following my soil um, disturbance um, order at all. In fact, the most disturbed um, uh, management, the organic one, is the one that actually has higher, uh, has the lowest losses of carbon since the start of the experiment and uh, now is the one with um, highest uh, carbon among the three. Um, so you might say, well, of course, what was the big deal. Of course, the organic management gets all this extra biomass input due to the cover crop. Well, um, here they are as far as the background biomass goes. And you can see that this order again is not conducive to current sequestration or disturbance uh, pattern because 
Um, their organic management, unfortunately, we were not doing very good job in growing those. Well, we couldn't, given no input um, in getting um, our main crops uh, growing. So their background environment input from it, or background environment um, there is much, much lower than what we get with conventional chemical input. And that uh, cover crop biomass really doesn't make up for the difference. Here it is with cover crop biomass added, and it's still significantly less on biomass input that we are getting there um, as compared to the other treatments. So here we have uh, the management with handful disturbance and low um, biomass input and high um, carbon gain. Okay, so that was one, one example. Here is my second example. Um, and this example comes from two experimental sites. One is located the same at Scout Biological Station in Michigan, and the other one was in uh, Wisconsin. In, um, in those two experiments, the two, two uh, management practices that I would like to tell you about is a switch pack. Um, so uh, all that is done for bioenergy rootstock production. So switch pack is one, and native succession vegetation is the other one. Native succession vegetation is basically your old field. So in uh, 2008, uh, the experimental plots that were assigned to that native succession vegetation were taken out of the agricultural production and whatever us could grow their um, native plants, invasive plants, weeds, whatever, uh, they just started growing and all we uh, did is um, mold them for the biomass. Um, so both systems, uh, perennial vegetation, um, no soil disturbance, not no plowing in kind since 2008 when they were established. Uh, this is what happens with their carbon. Uh, on the left are the data from our um, low facility KBS episode, and on the right are the data from the results from the nice uh, molecule uh, soil from uh, our Wisconsin site. And what, what you can see is that in both sites, there is significantly higher amount of carbon that was accumulated in the soil um, in five years after the start of the experiment under that old field native succession vegetation as compared to the switchgrass. So you might say, well, what, so, so what? Well, that's uh, what, so what? Uh, thing is, uh, this is uh, below common biomass uh, for those two systems. And uh, so green is, I before green is my witchcraft and yellow is native succession vegetation. And uh, as you can see, in terms of the amount of below common biomass, uh, witchcraft is just enormously higher as compared to native succession system. And KBS is what almost 100 times uh, greater um, as um, in uh, the Wisconsin molecule, 50 times greater. So um, um, a lot of research groups look at um, uh, these experiments, uh, soils of these experiments from different perspectives, and they really couldn't find any differences between uh, the switch press and um, native succession vegetation systems in terms of, well, virtually anything. So there were no differences in microbial community composition. There were no differences in fungal biomass. There were no differences in agricultural stability. Uh, there was this huge, um, hugely uh, larger, hugely greater um, root system that Switchgrass has. Um, along with this, this huge background biomass that it produces. And still we have really nothing as far as increases in soil carbon in those five years. Now, um, that's 10 years since, the, we are starting to see some increases in soil carbon switch risk, but 
uh, still they are not comparable to what we are seeing with native succession registration. <clears throat> okay, so back to my uh, recipe. Um, why, what, what's wrong? Um, there is something, something missing. And if, um, if we look again at the mechanism, so we need the input, we need microbes to um, eat them, we need the products of microbial processing to be protected somewhere. Um, well, whenever you look at the list like this, you implicitly assume that all those three steps somehow gradually take place in exactly the same location in space and soil. But the thing is that they are not, and um, well, the microbes have to get to plant residues and plant input, or plant input have to get to them. And what is um, what might be even more um, limiting is the step of the microbial uh, products to well after they're produced in order to be protected, they have to move to away from where the microbes are. They have to make uh, to move into that soil matrix where they can actually be protected. So what is missing, in my opinion, uh, from this picture, and what um, might be um, an explanation to these discrepancies between some of these experimental results that we are seeing and what our uh, expectations are, <coughs> is that we are overlooking that uh, step, the transport. Um, so what I would like to um, do is to rephrase uh, this last um, a step of the mechanism into um, what is needed is the ability of microbial products to fuse, move into such locations within the soil matrix where they can become either physically chemically protected or physically protected that is inaccessible to microbes. So they really have to physically go somewhere to become protected there. And uh, well, what drives movement and transport of everything in soil is soil pores. Um, they, that's where nutrients um, are moving through, uh, those two pores. This is where uh, microbes move through and um, um, soil pores. This is where the composition products um, are moving uh, through soil pores. Um, gases, gas diffusion, oxygen influx, all that takes place through uh, soil pores. And the size or uh, this carbon protection, from looking at it from carbon protection, perspective size is definitely matter. <coughs> so soil, um, again, we are talking about um, micro. Um, processing carbon and the product of that processing to go into uh, somewhere to be protected. So the places where the microbes can live and um, process enough carbon to make sizable impact on the uh, surrounding soil, those, of course, they have to be of some size and it has to be size big enough to accommodate not just a couple of microbes or bacterial cells, but has to be big enough to fit, you know, some sizable microbial colony in them. And it actually has been shown by a number of research groups that um, soil pores of this size range, somewhere in 10 to 100 micron resolution size range, that they are um, actually the places where intense decomposition of carbon is taking place. So, um, what my uh, subsequent work um, was, so my, my work was based on um, the previous findings that demonstrated the importance of these points. And what I would like to do now is to uh, tell you about several of our experiments and studies where we looked at those different um, important reports of the size range from different perspectives. Let me start with uh, the study where we um, 
from where we actually got the idea of what might be the uh, lower boundary for the, the important force from a uh, microbial um, perspective and carbon processing perspective. That the microns, at least for how um, the, the soil is setting. Um, what we did in that experiment is we created um, five uh, soil materials. So we aggregate seeds at different, uh, different seed sizes. And the point was that all materials will have the same total velocity, but that they will have a different core size distribution. Um, from those materials, we built uh, microcosms. And in um, each microcosm, we put in the middle a piece of uh, plant leaf for an soybean. Um, and then uh, we incubated them and looked at how much of the leaf was decomposing during the decomposition, uh, during the incubation. Uh, to quantify the decomposition, we used computer tomography, so we would send our microcosms um, at the start, that would be nice and fast seed in the beginning of the incubation, and then we scan them at the end, and that would be that what's left um, for the leaf after the incubation. Um, this is the key result, and on the um, y-axis is the percent <coughs> of um, our soybean leaves, one of soybean leaves that you see that is decomposed. Um, and these are the five contrasting materials with five contrasting four size distribution. Um, our five materials, they split into two distinct groups based on how much the leaf was decomposing in them. Um, in one group of these three materials, uh, about 80% of leaf was gone by the end of the, uh, end of the incubation. In this group of these two, about 50% of leaf was gone. Um, what, so we looked at everything as far as four characteristics and all kinds of characteristics of those materials. And what really separated them apart was the presence of these 30 um, micron cores and above. The group of these three with high decomposition of the uh, leaf, uh, they, they had sizable presence of these cores. And the other group, they barely had any of the cores of this size present. So this, and, and that makes sense probably from oxygen perspective because um, those 30 micron cores in our um, in our materials is where the is what provided sufficient influx of oxygen for uh, microbial functioning and was enhancing that decomposition. So that gives us this low boundary for what we consider to be um, um, that four size um, where mm -hmm carbon decomposition takes place and probably most of microbial activity takes place. Um, so for our upper boundary, let me tell you um, then about um, another study that uh, we uh, just recently completed. In there, we looked at five um, bioenergy rooftop production systems, continuous one corn with cover coat, witchcraft, or far and the same uh, native succession vegetation. Uh, from each of the <coughs> experimental plots, we collected um, a number of soil, intact soil cores, and uh, we again subjected them to computer tomography scanning. Uh, what you see here would be just the raw image of the cores uh, looked at from the side and looked look from the top for one of the cores. And then with image analysis, we um, have this gradient of grayscale value from where um, a lot of information can be extracted. So we can have this classification of particular organic matter or whole groups, light groups present in our soil cores, and we can have this um, segment that those grayscale images to see where the cores are and do the characterization of pore sizes and pore size distribution.
Um, so that was one piece of information that we had for those four. <laughs> and then um, came this second piece. So we looked at uh, potential enzyme activities in, um, in these uh, soil forms. And the way how we did that, we, um, um, we put the cores into this cutting table. And on the bottom of it, there is a, hand, there is a handle which um, allows to push the core out into tiny increments. Um, then we, with the microphone, we would cut off carefully the top slice of the core. Um, and then we would do um, demography analysis one. So demography would be um, creating a map of potential enzyme activities by placing a membrane saturated with substrate specific to, um, you know, any of those um, extracellular enzymes on the top of the soil core. And then, you know, that as a result of enzyme reaction with the substrate, there would be fluorescent sub, uh, substance blooms. And then after taking a picture in ultraviolet light, you get this map of relative enzymes potential and then activities um, on that on that surface um, that you were saying. So what we had for the study then is from our uh, CD image, we had uh, this information about our four characteristics. And from our demography, we had information about um, those relative enzyme activities. Um, and so we matched the two. And so then we have this data set where for um, every pixel of our enzyme map, we would have a relevant voxel or uh, for our characteristic or uh, voxel or for characteristic data. Um, what you see here is this summary of our results for the study. So on the y axis is the relative enzyme activity standardized so that we could compare both all the enzymes and all the um, practices. And um, on the x-axis are the uh, four radius. So we uh, basically classified our data into the voxels with prevalence of um, for the certain size. And then for those <laughs> specific groups, we would see what that that average enzyme activity was. So what we are finding is that there are these uh, the enzyme activities tended to be lower in um, the voxels that didn't have any pores uh, greater than 30 microns. And it also tended to be lower in the voxels that had a uh, very large pore support greater than 180 microns. And then um, it was quite um, high um, in all the voxels that uh, were dominated by, uh, with dominance of course of this size range, especially the 30 to 90 um, group. So in essence, what, what our take on these data is that the places within our soil course that had high presence of course of that 30 to 90, 30 to 150 micron size group is the places where somebody either were producing or produced before or some, somewhere in there, uh, there were a greater presence of enzymes and greater enzyme activities. Um, when, so that graph presented results for all our, across all our systems and all enzymes. Here, um, results separate for um, those five, um, bioenergy um, resource production system. And so this is that, so let me just point to you the main, um, the main, <coughs> oh, oh, the main um, thing here. And that is the difference between which trend continues for and this one will cover and the offline and native succession system. This trend I was telling you about with low, <coughs> um, low and then activities associated with low small pores and much high activity associated with presence of this medium-sized pores. It was very strongly present in switchgrass and it was almost 
non-existing, really non-existing in our poplar and native succession vegetation system. So um, the difference in um, microbial in activity of um, enzyme producers, be it microbial or former roots or whoever, it really was significantly <coughs> different <coughs> between uh, locations with presence of different spores and switch traps. And it really wasn't that different in um, native succession and uh, poplar systems. Um, so uh, the next talk was well, let's see. Um, now we are looking at those soil cores uh, that you know we took, and that was in March. So there was really not that much of live activity there. So let's see what happens if we stimulate uh, the the organisms that are in our course. And so to do that, uh, we are on some of, so some of our course and some of the <coughs> in them, we put a layer of uh, plant leaves, red clover, or flat chai, so nice one um, um, layer. So put some weight on it to make sure that there is good contact with soil and incubate it for weeks. <coughs> then we will remove them. Uh, that layer and do that enzyme analysis again, so do that enzyme mapping. Uh, what you see on the graph here is just now, just to make it simple, it's just two soil pore groups, the one um, <coughs> with no pores um, greater than 30 microns and the 30 to 150 micron group. And blue are the data from our original pores and red are the data from the pores where uh, microbes were assembled, well, microbes, I guess, were stimulated by our presence of that uh, plant input material. And you can see that, well, we did have this difference in uh, microbe in uh, enzyme activities before with higher ones in um, greater presence of these medium sized pores, but the difference became even greater after the microorganisms were stimulated by um, plant leaf, uh, plant <coughs> leaf addition. So whoever lives in the area dominated by these pores seems to like our, our plant additions and responded to their presence with production of more enzymes to, uh, I guess, decompose and use them. Um, and so one in um, our early study, we also saw that pores of that proximate side range are the ones that are really popular among a variety of microbial communities. So here, um, let me tell you about uh, this um, animal study. Um, and what we did here, we worked with those intact fragments of soil about five millimeter in size. We did CT scanning with them, that's what we always do, we always do CT scanning. And we characterized our uh, presence of pores and particular organic matter in those, um, in those aggregates. And then what we did was we called georeference uh, cutting of those aggregates. <coughs> so we physically cut them in pieces, but uh, it, we painstakingly um, Make sure that we know uh, the position, the relative position of each piece in relation to that CT scan image. And so then in each piece, um, our microbiological colleagues um, ran the uh, 16F analysis and um, gave us all that interesting uh, information about my microbial uh, bacterial community composition. So um, in essence, for every, every one of these slices, we had four information and we had microbial community information. What I have on this graph is, again, just a short piece of summary uh, for these data. And uh, specifically, uh, these are the data from the um, 100 top most abundant OTUs from uh, that analysis. Um, and uh, the three Bars are the data from um, the correspond to three core sizes. So 10 to 30, 30 to 90, and greater than 110 microns in size. 
and what's on the y-axis are the number of um, OTUs out of those 100, which were positively correlated with presence of each of these four. So out of 100, <coughs> uh, 20, more than 25 were significantly positively correlated with presence of uh, these fours. And well, there was also some 15 plus uh, correlated with presence of uh, these fours uh, with fours of uh, 10 to 30 microns. Um, size and uh, there was barely well five, which would be what you would expect with key value or zero higher size just by random chance as far as correlation with uh, forces that are greater than 100 percent. So what seems um, what how we interpret um, all this information is that force of this the size range somewhere 30 to whatever 90 100. <laughs> Uh, range are uh, that they are the places where a lot of microbial activity is taking place, and a lot of these bacteria um, seem to like uh, that um, those particular uh, portions of soil uh, matrix. Um, why do they like that? Uh, this is the last study that I want to tell you about, um, and what we did there is. Uh, we did this C3, C4 uh, natural abundance uh, change, um, um, plant community change study. Specifically in the greenhouse, we grew rice in a soil that before that was for uh, 15 years in just nothing but corn. Um, and then after a few months of that dry growth, we um, again got the entire four fragments of microaggregate from there. And uh, we <coughs> did the same, we used the same approach as uh, the one I just uh, told you about for our microbial analysis. That is, we um, scanned those um, aggregates and then we cut them in pieces. Um, but then in those pieces, instead of microbial analysis, we did delta 15C so that we could track where this new carbon that comes from dry, where did that go? And um, our aggregate, we separated them in two groups. In one group, we did that, that scanning and that cutting and that delta 15 C analysis right away, right after we collected them. And in the second group, we incubated, so we, we scanned, yes, but then we incubated them for about a month. And then we did the cutting and delta to the analysis. So what we found is uh, that on the x-axis here is the relative abundance of the our favorite force, 30 to 90 uh, micron uh, size range. And on the uh, y-axis is uh, the delta to the C or basically a new carbon, the more negative, the more uh, new dry carbon there is. Blue is the data that we got from the aggregate uh, that were processed and analyzed right after collection. And red are the data from the aggregate that were subjected to the incubation. So what we are seeing is that initially, the more of those pores we had, <coughs> Um, in the aggregate, uh, the higher was the presence of the new carbon from that site. But then, after we incubated them, it completely changed, and actually, greater presence of force of the site range was associated with lower levels of new um, high carbon. So, what um, what our interpretation is that well, it makes perfect sense the force of the size will be the one where new carbon from high would go, right? So that's the perfect size for fine roots, um, young roots, and there would be those root exudates uh, that will be delivering new carbon into the soil. But then, as we've seen uh, from the previous work, these pores are also the places heavily, well, more heavily populated with 
microorganisms that are ready to pounce when new carbon comes in and produce enzymes and uh, decompose all that stuff. So what we think is what's happening during that um, incubation is they were just eating uh, the newly coming carbon. Um, and um, well, there was of course nothing new coming in during the incubation. So it's just um, the, the decrease in it was quite substantial um, in those uh, places, in those large forests or medium sized forests where uh, the microbes were most present. Um, so, what, what, where it brings um, us now um, into is this idea that probably for those, this size range, um, when I was thinking of them as you know, prime real estate as far as microorganisms go. Uh, they are the areas that have new carbon from plants. Uh, they do have sufficient physical space to build sizable colonies. Uh, they might be, we haven't really tested experimentally this, they might, but it's reasonable to expect that they are uh, optimal um, as far as, you know, in comparison with very large or very small forests in terms of water regime um, and transport opportunities and movement opportunities, they definitely are very good as far as oxygen supplies go. So that these are the places where microbes like to live in, at least again in uh, the soils we work with. So what, um, well, what all that has to do then with carbon and lack of carbon gains, uh, examples that I um, showed you in the beginning. Um, I told you, right, that, you know, we have several research groups intensively working on the switchgrass and native succession vegetation and finding no real any differences among them. Uh, well, there was a difference in terms of uh, physical characteristics and specifically these two systems were very different in terms of presence of the, the forest of this our favorite site. And so what you see on the background are examples of the images from switchgrass showing these forests and native succession samples showing these forests. You can visually see that the huge difference in uh, intensity of their presences. Um, and the bars, of course, represent quantitative um, differences. Um, in presence of these forests in um, which have a native succession of vegetation. So what I uh, would think is happening and how all this plays into uh, gaining or not gaining carbon. So um, this is rather busy um, concept that we think explains what is taking place. So roots, um, influence not just microbial communities uh, through the chemical input of the exudates and their quality and quantity, but they also influence uh, microbial communities by contributing to creation of the, the prime real estate, uh, the force of that good size that is heavily populated by microbes. And again, the force is where all the carbon processing takes place. So when uh, those spores are in plenty and they are widely spread through the entire coral matrix, then there is a lot of opportunity for contact and for movement of microbial decomposition products from places where they are produced by microorganisms into places where they can actually be stored. So in our uh, switchcraft, that would be switchgrass system. And this is how we envision uh, pores and carbon um, processes taking place there. That is, they're, they're, those optimal pores are hewn, and they're probably heavily, heavily populated by microbes there. And uh, well, once the once microbes um, work on the, those new carbon inputs, the decomposition products, they just don't have that much place where they can go. So they keep staying there and they are completely decomposed and they are 
comes into CO2 and will stay go into the atmosphere. And then what we have is the soil matrix that is not in contact with those highly productive microbial final phase sites. And it's just, it's not gaining carbon because it's not reaching it. And this will be our uh, view of what takes place in the native vegetation, uh, succession vegetation. Is that there, those primate phase spores are everywhere. Um, high microbial activity is uh, everywhere, but there is, um, as I said, there are a lot of opportunities for this carbon product to move into the soil and to then be uh, protected there. Um, so basically, that, that's the end of, end of my story. And um, definitely, I would like to uh, thank a lot of people, a lot of, lot of people who uh, were part of these multiple studies and overall this work and uh, funding sources. And I, again, would like to thank you for, your, um, for coming here. And if I can answer any questions. you go back to your first example you don't have to go back to the slides but you explain the push grass but did not explain the first example where the the no-till is not as enriched in carbon as was the organic or the conventional um i i i was hoping that that um, maybe you would not know yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I have this unconventional idea that that um, in the settings where um, we continuously uh, producing new inputs of carbon, new plant inputs into the soil, like from cover crops, uh, that's what happens in that organic system. That all that tillage might actually not be such a good such a bad thing, I should say, because according to this, our view, well, according to this theory, um, in this case, uh, there are more opportunities for that newly produced carbon input from the cover crop to come in contact with the soil that previously was not, um, was not receiving um, carbon and more opportunities for that new carbon input to be protected. So it's like with compost, if you, if you mix it, then you get, get the best result. But I know that it's probably not the only explanation, and I, I wouldn't really fight for it, but that's just an idea. Well, when you say continuous tillage in that situation, too, where they're yak, a rotary hoe is really just pretty shallow uh, disturbance, and you're disturbing the same uh, strata again and again, so it seems like maybe once you deplete that strata, you're, you're having very little impact on the rest of the soil profile. Um, yeah, so, but uh, it's probably not just that shallow weeding tillage, but it's probably just a wilding um, as well. That, oh, well, more, more, more that would be from chisel wilding. Because, so what we have there is this constant influx of inputs and that. I think maybe how to redistribute it even between that post cloud surface. Where do um, fungal hyphal networks sort of fall in your poor in your poor size uh, framework? Uh, that's that's another very good question that I was hoping I will not get. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we haven't really so. Um, well, we have we have uh, um, we started collaboration with um, the um, our fun, fungal people, and um, our preliminary results show that uh, what we are nicely seeing as far as bacteria goes might not necessarily be most applicable to fungi because they would spread through much bigger um, matrix of uh, soil as compared to bacteria. But um, I would say in terms of, so my guess is that it's probably, the, the, whole, the whole principle probably would apply to fungi as well, because 
Well, um, those forests are the places where um, plant inputs are, and the plant, uh, those residues where they are, so fungi will be going after them. And just as with um, um, bacteria, well, even more so, the, the very small forests are the ones where fungi can simply can get. So I think that will be the same, the same would work the same for them, but um, probably in a much less detectable manner because they can just cover so much of the soil matrix and are not restricted in their movement um, as, as the area. So you think it's really the roots that are forming these pores then, um, or, or what is the, what's the formation? It, based on what this slide, I thought it sounded like you, you think it's roots that are forming pores. Yeah, yeah. So given that we, um, so if looking at these two systems, which has a native succession vegetation, um, as I mentioned, people did look at uh, fungal communities and they did look at fungal biomass and they couldn't, they didn't see any sizable difference in them. Any difference, I think. Uh, but there is this big difference, of course, in root system. So, um, I think at least in our world, and again with the, these systems, it's, it's those who do, who produce the differences. So switchgrass well, has too many big roots. It's got not enough small roots. Uh, no, it's, it's uh -huh. not enough. Well, again, um, one, one group um, worked at specifically pine roots. And in terms of overall biomass, they, there is no difference between them. So it does have, um, switch grass does have much more big roots, but it's not that it has fewer or less roots, fine roots than the, the other system. So it's it's all very, I don't know, <laughs> it's it's all at the initial stages. You don't really have um, all the final answers. So we are saying, um, greenhouse studies with bush press and plants from um, two communities to see if we can actually um, handle that what we do and what we don't do and how they do um, together and in more cultures and in um, mixtures. But that we're just studying that now. So hopefully that will bring some more answers. I was wondering with your micro CT data, are you able to calculate the connectivity of the pores? Um, yes, we can. We can do that. Yeah, we haven't really uh, been doing it for uh, these studies. We only looked at four size distribution, but yes, you can. You can calculate. You can determine um, connectivity. You can identify pores that are connected. Yeah, I was just because wondering if there's like a correlation between pore size and connectivity. And it's um so it's in, in practice it's 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 hard to and to tell them apart because when you have high porosity and a lot of pores, um it it just translates into low high connectivity. And when you have fewer pores, then it, by nature that they, they, there will be um, lower connectivity there. So that's why we really most of uh, these general characterizations, we really didn't focus on uh, connectivity, but uh, we focused on overall how many points of different sizes we have. Uh, during the bacterial enzymatic tests, uh, did you maintain the soil water con uh, content constant? <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, yes, so the, the test itself um, it just takes 30, 30 minutes. That's what, how, how long we did that incubation with the, um, with the, with the mapping. Um, and um, we did cover them with during that, in, that incubation so that Membrane goes on soil and then it's covered with aluminum foil, so there was no soil drying 
to take place during the during that weekend? And did you conduct the test under different water content levels or or at uh, one particular water? Um, and it was all done just at this one same same stage of those water or those pores or same water and would, you, and would you say then that those pores between 30 and 90 micrometers that they were air filled or were they water filled? Um, they were air filled at the, at, the, at the moment. But the thing is that when we put um, the, that membrane, saturated membrane on the surface, then I guess that the very top of it does everything become saturated with. Uh, with the saturated solution from the membrane. But yeah, those are the yeah, that's, that's your right on top of it. <laughs> those exactly are the the issues in incorporating this uh, demography data. Is, yeah. uh, I really do do appreciate what you showed us today. Uh, what is your your next step? So as I was as I was saying, we are trying to um, understand more what what do we have with um, this effect of fruit on formation of soil structure and uh, what happens with roots um, afterwards. So I uh, like those daily experiments because I think they're too complicated, but I think I we are ready to move into with the competition. So um, we're going to explore how a uh, different combination of plants influence formation of soil structure and how all that how that translates into and how that they influence the uh, the amount of carbon input. So we're going to do some um, labeling and see where new carbon goes and you know try to further dig into all these. Um, one last question. Uh, did you take your samples uh, during the wet season uh, or the dry season? That was in March. So it was by this time. <laughs> would, be interesting, would be interesting to see if there's any history. So I would say there could probably be a history effect. So if, if the soil pores have been filled with water or the soil overall has been wet for a long time, Mm -hmm. compared to after a uh, drying season. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting to look at, especially looking at um, how these relationships differ when we take soil from so during growing season when uh, the micro micro size there and see if see what what we get then. This would be uh, basically looking at who is there, who was there still alive and watch yeah. um, you know, stimulating them with high temperatures and with those um, inputs. In the case on the right, where you have more uh, pores and better connectivity, do you think that the, the microbial products that are stabilized are as stable as the less connected? Because it seems like the diffusion of the microbial products would coincide with the change in the enzyme. Um, yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, my uh, my thinking is that uh, they um, so probably there is this initial level of saturation by uh, this carbon and protection uh, that. Uh, would be the same in all of them and everywhere and everywhere. But then, when more carbon starts to come on top of that, this is when it the carbon either becomes accessible to microbes directly or it becomes decomposable by enzymes. Um, but but that initial initial influx really gets the types and protect it. That's again my my sort of thinking. 
was, I was also wondering if you are uh, looking at temperature and soil moisture. It seems that some of the treatments, uh, like different crops, and especially a winter cover, might interact and influencing um, soil moisture and the temperature, and that could partially explain different carbon dynamics. And then I was wondering if that those combined with the different soil structure could be and um, so that soil temperature, moisture, um, and also knowing where the carbon is, or if it's on the top, or if it's incorporated, and uh, that alone could be a good model to describe carbon dynamics, because then the microbial community will respond to uh, conditions that were appropriate if there's oxygen and water. Um, so definitely, yes, you know, temperature is extremely important. Um, my, um, with this particular um, experiment and field study, where these data come from and these treatments, I don't believe that there were any sizable differences um, between the systems in terms of in small house and small <coughs> temperature. Because they are very much very similar. As if you if you look at those plant communities in any time of the year, um, there is really no. It, it's not like one of them um, gets only heated in summer and the other doesn't. They they basically same intense pervasive communities and they uh, the the full temperatures there over the period of study period were quite similar. Um, well, so far we can't really, yeah, we can't look at different moisture and we can't look at different temperatures either. But that, that definitely would be interesting given that I'm real concerned in how warming might be affecting soil carbon. Okay, well, thank you all.